Hey folks, welcome to Conversations with Curtis. I'm Paul Stetler and I am the host of this channel. And if you're brand new to, to this channel, you might be wondering if my name is Paul, why is this channel called Conversations with Curtis? And that is a really good question. Uh, the reason is that back in 1996, I played the character Curtis Craig in Phantasmagoria 2 that was produced by Sierra Online. Now, the reason I played Curtis Craig is before that, the owner of Sierra Online, Roberta Williams, created the original Phantasmagoria that Victoria Marcel Hemmingson starred in as Adrian Delaney. All this to say, after many, many months of trying to get her to come on our show, we finally landed Roberta Williams herself. And today we will be sharing with you our conversation with her. And you get to see Roberta and Tori seeing each other for the very first time since they wrapped Phantasmagoria a long time ago. We have a great conversation. Daniel joins us and Roberta was just super kind and fun and just willing to chat about everything. So here we go. Please enjoy our conversation with the one and only Roberta Williams. Well, <laughs> Roberta Williams, it is a pleasure. Welcome to Conversations with Curtis and thank you so much for, for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. So you and I have never met, and and we have a uh, a very interesting connection. Um, uh, now I don't remember. Did you ever swing by the sets uh, when we were filming Fantas Two? Were you? Uh, I don't know that. Um, I remember you were filming in that big, large building that's kind of on this hill overlooking, you know, the the I ninety freeway on the right. outskirts. Seattle, Bellevue-ish yeah. area or Red, Red, Redmond, some I forgot yeah. exactly, but down that area, yeah. In this center area, it was kind of a weird area, but when you're on the I five going south, um, or on the I ninety going east, you see it and you pass by it, and it was always this really um, strange building, you know. And, and are you doing it? Yeah, we're doing it. Obviously. You're interrupting. <laughs> DJ was asking if it started yet and whether or not it was Yes, ready I'm to sorry. Watch. Get out. <laughs> I can't That's it. We're just, we're just, uh, she just, she just kicked out the other owner of the, of, <laughs> that's great. No so worries. Relief. That's right. The comic relief. Yeah. That's all right. So yeah, okay. we were, yeah, we did film in that. Did you use that uh, space that, that, um, no, for other, uh, for other games besides that one? I don't think so. Um, and in fact, I used to, before you guys used it, when we first, that was just not long after we moved to uh, Seattle area mm -hmm. and um, from, from California. And I, I remember you know, Ken, you know, we'd be driving along and I'd say, what is that building? It looks so creepy. You know, it's just like this. What is that? I, and I, I and I and I would literally say, do you think that's a a mental uh, or, a you know, a, me a mental health, you know, play, a hospital, mental yeah, hospital or, yeah. or asylum? You know, I said like those words back then. Um, he goes, I don't know. But actually, um, uh, we think we do know that uh, that was one of the first places that Jeff Bezos um, rented for the beginning of Amazon. Is that but right? I, that's what was after you guys. Interesting. So I think you were there first filming your Phantasmagoria 2, and then Jeff Bezos rented it for As the a beginning warehouse. of Amazon. Isn't that something? Wow, I, I, never... I know his office was in there and... You know, and, and a warehouse or, and whatever else they were doing, it was in there. Uh, not for very long, I don't think, right. because Amazon grew so fast. Yeah, yeah. But they were, and I think they were the the people renting it and leasing it after you. <laughs> 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 so that was an interesting yeah. story. Absolutely, yeah. But um, yes, so I've been, in, I've been in there, yes, okay. um, to, see, to see what you guys were doing. Yeah, we uh that was a long as 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 I imagine uh Fantas 1 was it was a a long grueling shoot. We spent uh yeah, many months How long that. were you? You know, if How I many it, months? I think it was originally scheduled for 3 months and I think it ultimately ended up being closer to s between 5 and 6. It was a it was yeah. quite a 
We but it was very ambitious because we, you know, unlike Phantas One, you had decided to get, you know, eschew the green screen and really use sets and on location and really created that was that felt so much more like a, a movie set, uh, really more than anything. And so it makes sense yeah, that so it, much of that um, was We were four months though shooting. Yeah. So almost as much as you. Almost, so it was a long yeah. shoot as well. Yeah. And because it was so difficult because we actually called it blue screen, but it's the same idea. Right, right. Um and um but it was um it was very technically very difficult. So um it was longer shoot than you would normally have say on a movie or or TV TV episode, you know, series or something. It was yeah. it, in both our cases because it was interactive, so you had to shoot all the alternate mm. scenes that a player might want to do <clears throat> not just you know you're not just shooting a movie you know that's linear and just following the script you know you do have a script but you've got all the alternate stuff and you got to shoot that and that takes a lot, a lot of time yeah that was the part i remembered being you know fair, fairly i was just a year or two out of graduate school so i hadn't done a lot of film work at that point and you know i'd done enough but but yeah that that so those shorter scenes where you're just having a different reaction to a, the same question a bunch of different times. That was a very interesting process, just having to do so many different different uh, takes of that that same moment. So I do want to say that uh, I want to th- congratulate you on your newest game uh, on Colossal Cave. And, and uh, I, I got a chance to play a little of it last week. In fact, Tori and I both played a little of it and we streamed our, uh, our you know, yeah. we got about uh, not too much in it. We did Tori and I are neither of us are are gamers, and part of what makes this channel kind of fun is that these two actors who happen to be in these video games are now playing some of these classic games for the very first time. Well, you so will learn. Audiences will learn. are yeah, they're 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 seeing us learn how to you know figure out the language of video games, and it's been really fun and and being able to play both of our games together, which was great because we had never played them before. Um, we had, and so to actually have to, you know, go through the entire experience that, that the game, you know, that. Well, now that I have you here, what was your reaction to playing your game? And then I'll ask Tori that when she's on, what was your reaction to your game when you played it? You know what? Um, that's a great question. So my, my reaction (laughs) was, uh, I had seen a lot of the, the, video footage. And in fact, I think I use some of it for my, my acting reel. So I had seen a lot of it. And so when I started to play the game, that was very familiar to me. What I wasn't prepared for was the mood of the piece and how, when you're, when you're, st- when you're in that screen and you're in that, whatever room, whether it's Curtis's apartment or whether it's, uh, you know, Adrian's, uh, you know, house, you start to just feel a, a sense of the world because you can take so much time to get from one place to another. And, and so there was a, a, certainly with, with my game, uh, there was a, a creepiness that started to, to get to me that I didn't expect from thinking that I knew so much about it, but, you know, and then of course the puzzles and not quite knowing how to get from one room to another or get, you know, what, whatever, though that would be frustrating and kind of fun to figure that stuff out. But yeah, it, it, it I think with both situations, they both created a, um, a, a mood and an atmosphere that, that surprised me. I guess that's my best way of, of saying it. Yeah. It might be too, because, um, different from a movie where you just, you're watching it. And obviously you could be freaked out and scared by a movie, of course. Um, I know I have, you know, I go, oh my God, no, (laughs) (laughs) you know, but, um, but I think playing a game, you get, I think you get more involved in it personally, emotionally playing a game because you are, your heart rate starts to go. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, It really does. Wrong decision, you know, uh, you would go, oh my God, what's going to happen if I make the wrong decision. And so you're more actively and emotionally engaged which I think can add to, you know, kind of the creepiness and moodiness. Yeah. And hopefully, yeah. hopefully scaring a player because, and I'll get in, I'll get into that when we get more into the phantasmagoria discussion, but that's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Well, before we do get into that, can you tell me uh, what, what was it that 
uh, and it's been a while since you had created a game. It had been many years. What was it that brought you back in and why did you, uh, uh, what was it about Colossal Cave that was the, the thing to kind of get you back into this, uh, into this world? Well, here's how it started. COVID came and uh, this was uh, in like October. No, no, we'll see. When did we, I guess people didn't really figure out that it was, it was there until beginning of 21, I guess. Anyway, it was somewhere around that time. And uh, we we have a home in in uh, the desert of California, near Palm Springs. And Ken and I were sitting out on our um, in our porch area and having coffee, because we like to do that in the mornings, sort of talk over the day and what what are we doing? We're we're, you know, and it, it was just the very beginning of the lockdowns. It was, and it was very heavy, you know, all that was going on. We all know, we all were there. And um, Ken and I are very adventurous people. And we had just spent more than 15 years traveling in our boat, yeah. uh, our own boat, uh, you know, um, driving it ourselves, managing it ourselves. Ken's a captain. He has a hundred ton, you know, captain's license and, and I'm a very good navigator and uh, first mate and uh, and bottle, brush, kitchen person, everything, you know, housekeeper. <laughs> and we, we went around the world um, and, and that's what we, we kind of did. And uh, we realized when COVID came that, well, you know, we're not going to do that. The, the whole world sort of shut down and, and we're very uh, energetic people. And we're just always have to have a project. We're always have to do something. We can't just sit around. We're not, we're not that kind of people. And uh, I, Ken was, was telling me that he was learning unity. Um, how, it, cause Ken's a programmer. He's a yeah. really, I mean, yeah. he's a top notch, you know, I mean, he's a software engineer. Um, and uh, he was saying, you know, I, I was just learning unity um, to, to see if I can, you know, get some 3d programming done. And he was thinking about doing a little game and, and, and it was going to be a game for teaching kids or people, the beginning of programming. And he told me that. And I said, you know, we're having our coffee. And I, I stopped and I said, Oh, well, that's interesting. I said, is the game going to be fun? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> Well, I think it will. <laughs> He's a programmer, you know, and I, I said, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. And that night um, I was laying in bed and I was thinking about the fact that Ken was thinking about doing a game and it was just sort of bringing me back because uh, I, I really was, when we sold Sierra, I was real, and I stayed an extra year after Ken, we sold it. <clears throat> and if you, sorry, I'm going to clear my voice sometimes. That's okay. No worries. No worries. Yeah. I do the same. Um, and uh, when well, I might get hoarse on you, but it's a thing. Um, but uh, I, uh, he, he, after he sold our company, he left. You know, he went on to do other things. And I was still working on King's Quest VIII, Mask of Eternity, for another year to get it out. You know, I wasn't going to just walk away because that's not, that's the way I am. You know, I just don't do that. And, um, so I was there and then, uh, and really sad about, I actually was very sad about selling yeah. Sierra because I loved my job. I mean, yeah. I really did. And, and um, I think going out on the boat and circumnavigating and getting us away was sort of a way to just, you know, put our mind or at least my mind into something else, you know, and something, and it, it was a heavy duty thing to do. It was great. But now we're back, and now we can't do that. And Ken's going to do a game, and I was laying there in bed and just going, "What about Whoa. me?" So he's got something, you know, and and everything. And then and and Colossal Cave started my career, but not just mine. And this is something that was very surprising to me. Once we started working on on Colossal Cave, so many people came to us, bigwigs, names you would know names a lot of people would know and that are now running very large corporations and um and other things but names you would absolutely know said so, you know colossal cave started my career too wow and uh what was it, it about what, how would you can you explain how it started your career well is, um well i mean it's a lot i don't you, you know we don't want to get in the weeds of that sure I think, sure but, but but in terms of it just in terms of inspiration and uh 
Well, yeah, I mean, um, in in early 1980, Ken was doing some contract programming. He was still a programmer, mm-hmm. uh, and but he was doing some night contract work as well. And I just had um, my second child, so I was um, not working at that at that point. Um, and uh, again, sort of like, oh, I do, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I'm happy about that and stuff. But um, but he had a he had a teletype machine that that his work. His contract work had given him to bring home. The teletype machine was his way of um, getting into the, the 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 computer of, of which he was working at that was 50 miles away, was Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. So at night he could use the teletype machine. It had a router in it to get into the server of Children's Hospital. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, it's mainframe computer and to work and work. And, well, one day he decided to search into that in in more into the computer there and see what else was on there, and he found there was some games, and there were well I remember three games there might have been more but one was a football game that was just all text X's and O's for the teams, uh, one was Star Trek and again it was just text and it was X's and O's and numbers and things that moved around to be the it was kind of like kind of like an early um, space invaders kind of thing in, okay. in a way, although it did have some strategy and some story all in text. And this other thing called Advent. And and at first he checked out the football and they checked out Star Trek and then he checked out, now what is that, Advent? Well, it was short for adventure. And there's a reason it was Advent, which I can't really remember now, but it had to do with I don't know how many how, how many um, letters or uh, that you could have in whatever it was that Will Crowther, the designer, was doing, mm-hmm. which I don't really quite understand. But um, but it stood for adventure uh, and colossal cave adventure, and that that game was there. It's, it was a text adventure game. It was a first adventure game, and arguably. The first computer game. Hmm. I can't say for sure, but it was being developed uh, in 1976. Wow. Uh, wow. Really started in about 1975, um, and by Will Crowther, uh, who also it, in that a lot of people don't realize this, but he was also one of the main inventors and programmers of the internet. Uh, he was working for a company called uh, BBN. It, it's on that little documentary that you yeah. see at the you know, when you go into the right. Well, we did. Game. We went in there. We started to watch it, and I was getting so I was getting like so it, caught up in it that I thought, oh, we actually have to play the game. So we ended up having it's to. A great document, but it's really short. I mean, it's not no. like long. I think it's seven minutes long. Okay. And then uh, if, if you um, if you click the hand again, it goes into the strategies and tips of playing oh, fun. Uh, the cloth cape. But anyway, but so we did a, a little a, a little of the uh, the seven minute documentary of the making of Colossal Cave, the original, you know, not not this one <laughs> that we did, and it explains who Will Crowther is and explains the thing about the ARPANET and the internet, and uh, he was the main programmer. Um, uh, the, the military Pentagon probably came to BBN, which stood for, I can't remember. It's in the, it's in the documentary (laughs) and which was bought by Raytheon. Raytheon now owns that, that BBN. Uh, but it came to them and, uh, cause they did a lot of specialized programming, really, really high end stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, BBN and, uh, and Will Crowther was, was doing, um, uh, so he was doing work on AI, early AI. Um, it was one of the things he was doing for for BBN. And the the military came to to them and said, "We we want to have um, a program where uh, we want to have a basically it's a platform or you know to where 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 computers can communicate with them from different servers, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, all over the country. Um, that 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 can happen." And uh, Will Crowther, along with three others, were uh, assigned that job. And, um, and it was basically to come up with a, a packet switching um, programming for allowing computers to communicate with each yeah, other, yeah, yeah. You know, university to university or wherever they happen to be. And at this point, it was all mainframe, large mainframe computers we're talking about. And that's what Will Crowther did, and he was the main packet switcher programmer. Yeah. Uh, and um, 
and but yet he also did Colossal Cave. Long story. It's on the documentary. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but that so it that it went from there to uh, because it was on the ARPANET. Um, the ARPANET started being taken to different universities and corporations. Um, he was, uh, I, I think he was also very affiliated with MIT. Okay. And it just, it just got downloaded and put out there. And so I, Ken got a hold of it and I played it and I was very obsessed with it, um, uh, addicted to yeah. it. And it, it inspired me. Nice. And so you decided to do, Long yeah. And, and then getting <laughs> it to, uh, you know, taking that as your, your entry point back in after, after, you know, uh, being away for so long. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you, you're doing a very, uh, um, what's the word? You're, you're a very, uh, um, see, I'm going to, you're, dev what's it called? You're, it's a very devoted, that's not the right word. A true adaptation original. of the game. Uh, it, original. Is that a, the word you're looking well, for? Well, <laughs> orig original in the way that you're doing it, but it's uh, mm -hmm. it's true to the game yeah. itself. You yeah. didn't take yeah. a lot. Is, did you take a, a much liberty in terms of the um, story or the, the more more liberty than you might think? Yeah. Um, the gameplay is as much as we could keep it. Um, I know there is an issue on um, save you know save games and, and being able to die. Um, which is an issue with um, a lot of the earlier Sierra games, which back in the 80s and 90s was pretty much um, what it, people did. I mean, that's the way game gaming was done back then. Um, so that was that. But um, and you know, and maybe Colossal Cave started that. I yeah. don't. I don't know. But um, I kept that that part also. Um, which I know in the modern day era is not something, you know, that is necessarily what people like. Mm. But uh, and what was interesting about that is we you, me and my team, Ken and I, we we hired we had a team of about 35 people wow. that we we went out and uh, and contracted with and um, worked with them remotely on teams. I mean, very, very, very closely. And uh and, and I was told, you know, I said, you know, it's the modern gamers today, you know, they want, they need a lot of hand holding, you know, and everything. And this Colossal Cave is kind of, um, I don't want to say necessarily it's a hard game. It is kind of a hard game. Um, it's easy to get into. There's a lot of it, it. At first, it just feels like you're exploring. That's where we, that's as far as we got. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, you're exploring. A cave and and the interface I made the inter I kept the interface very easy point and click uh, because I didn't want people to have to think too much about the inter you know how to get through the game and and you know but although you can use you know keyboard and mouse if you want or you could just use just mouse or joystick and yeah. joystick and you know there I mean every kind of uh, way you might want to play a game we support on this pro project. But, um, but if you only just want to use a mouse, you can do that right. all as well. And at first you just, it, you know, it's, it's very exploratory. The, the UI is very easy to get into. Um, so that I just wanted people just to be able to get into it and not think about that, you know, and it's very, it, very quickly you get used to it. Mm -hmm. But, um, the, but after a while you start seeing that, there's more to it than just exploring a cave and picking up items and yeah. using them. Um, and, and there, and at some point a strategy becomes available to you and you start sensing that there's a, a larger strategy going and, you know, and I don't need to get too much into that, but, but there is, and it begins to dawn on you. There's a lot more to this than, than originally meets the eye. And, and um, that's when, a, a, you know, my team starts saying, I don't know, you know, this might be uh, <laughs> too honestly, complicated to, and a lot uh... of, most of my, most of my team were, you know, you know people in their mid forties and down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they said, you know, people don't want to think as much. They actually told me that. <laughs> oh no! And I said, oh no, you've got to be kidding. You know, they, well, you know, today's players, you know, and I said, well, no, no, no. I just, I can't believe that. And, uh, 
So I just said, I'm just going to leave the game as original as I can. And, and yes, you can die. And I said, that was original. And that's the way it is. And I don't know that I want a handhold. However, having said that, Faithful was the word well. that I was I was looking faithful. for. Being faithful. Yeah. Having, having said that, I, I we did do some hand holding stuff. We really did. Um, I'll, although I'm going to, we're doing a major upgrade. We're starting to work on it uh, for Colossal Cave. We're going back in for um, PC platforms, the higher end um, PC platforms, including the Mac and you know xbox that can run it you oh, know the wonderful. higher end wonderful um we're uh we were redoing a lot of the graphics making them much more detailed um and beautiful and nice. also adding some more sound effects um uh footsteps oh you wonderful know, yeah yeah adding that um uh we're adding we're gonna have shadows and lantern light that move with you because so it's you still know, it's still being you know, you're still and playing then, with it you know, yeah. and sort of a little bit of the bobbing and weaving of the lantern light to give you that sense of walking wonderful you know we're going to do that um what else oh auto save um we're we're gonna i've been one i wanted to put that in way back mm -hmm. um yeah. but we just didn't we didn't do it but we're, well, i have we're a question for you what what was uh did, did, were you was your team you know, it's been out now. People have been playing it. Uh, do do uh -huh. you find that your team was right? Or do you feel that people enjoyed having the challenges that you put in? This uh, they were right and wrong. You know, it was interesting. You know, they were right in um, in the ways. I mean, they pulled me into doing some of the hand-holding stuff we did do. Uh, and, uh, but, um, but... I don't, they weren't right in, um, in really changing the game. Uh, uh, I, we did add a little more story. Um, not much because, uh, that would have really, that would have, uh, really interrupted the original gameplay. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but we did do some mostly of a graphical nature. So it's more that you see it. Uh, there's, uh, I, I wrote a lot of messages, a lot of additional messages that were not in the original game. The, the original game was all text and we kept in all, all written by, uh, Will Crowther and Don Woods, who came in later okay. as a, as an additional designer, um, to add a lot more, um, puzzles. And he added in the points, the scoring, uh, for the game, the point system. And, uh, I, I just I kept all of the messages and the original descriptions written by the original designers, but I added a lot more because yeah, of yeah, the yeah. nature of having graphics and going through this world. Um, and uh, but that's why we had a narrator. Yeah. Sorry, it's probably the housekeepers. That's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah. What is the is there a what's the comment what's the best comment you've received so far either from a fan or a review that that made you feel like your your vision was was uh... oh, well, the, um hold on a minute let me, yeah, let me sure. go first. sorry sorry about that everybody <laughs> but uh, i need i need to i need to calm her yeah no worries. she'll be fine yeah 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 um the uh, yeah i know what you're getting at <laughs> Um, the, uh, what happened is we really shipped the game. And one of the things we didn't realize, Ken and I, is we're, you know, we know a lot about developing games. We know a lot even, and, and it's funny because when we, it had been 25 years and, and, uh, when we first started the project, um, we both set, asked ourselves, are we going to be able to get back into this? You know, I mean, is this just, or is this going to be really hard for us? And what I discovered with both Ken and I, I mean, Ken just literally got back into programming. I mean, he's been programming all along. I mean, that's just what he does. That's his hobby. Um, but I, I, you know, it just came back just like it, I, you know, had just written a game a, a year before yeah. it just came back granted i had a, a design already pre-done mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that, <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, that helped i didn't have to come up with one 
Uh, but I did, you know, I did have to quickly learn um, what all the new rules, yeah. you know, of, of game design and gaming. I had to, you know, I had to come up with that and figure it out. And, 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 and that's not as easy as you may think. Um, you could be an experienced game designer from way back. And and then you'd be gone like Rip Van Winkle, you know, and then suddenly wake up and it's 25 years later and, you know, think you can do it um, and things have changed, yeah, of yeah. course. And then when you decide that you're going to do an old game, an original game, and you're going to do it because of love, I love the game, uh, I, I thought it would be a great vehicle to try to get back into it. Um, it stood it has stood the test of time. Now, not everybody has played it, but millions of people have played it. Literally, they have. And um, in, t in the original text form. And so it's like, well, this game has stood the test of time. So it obviously has something going for it, you know. Uh, and I loved it. And uh, and it has started the, the careers of many, yeah. like I said, very important people who are now in the video game industry. <clears throat> and... Um, so I thought this will be great, you know, and and I could get back into it, and then I can learn, you know, what's all going on in the industry, and and but it was interesting for me, not as the designer, I I am not the designer of this game. I am I was the revivalist. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right. I don't know yeah. what you call it, yeah. but. But um, and and I had to make a lot of decisions. But this is a retro game, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, it existed back in time, and we kept it. We we always imagined when doing the art for this game and just thinking about the game and the objects around and stuff. Um, and you especially see it at the very very end of the game. That this is kind of set in the late seventies, early eighties. So we wanted to kind of keep it looking like that and feeling like that. Yeah. That not only yeah. is this an older game, but you, you in a way kind of went back in time, sort of. And But I had to balance um, between how do you take an old, and this is like a historical document. I mean, it really is. This is a piece of history in the computer industry and in computer game industry um, that that started it all. If you could really look at it that way, mm -hmm. so how do I take something that's this important, bring it back, recreate it, try to keep it feeling like what it is, but yet want to appeal to you know hopefully bring in modern game players. How do I do that? It's a it was a real real balancing act Oof, yeah. that is uh, much harder to to do than a lot of people might think no that does sound, um, that sounds and uh but uh beginning so i think at the very beginning when we, we when we released it we misunderstood first of all the marketing i think we did fine with the game itself i think we pushed it out a little too soon but um we didn't understand the marketing and the sales of how to sell in today's world because mm. it's much different than it was 25 years ago. And that, and so that we, that came out, we had a couple of kind of nasty reviews at uh -huh. the very beginning, which of course set the scene. Um, but since then, yeah, I know it's hard uh, to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you're always going to have, <laughs> that's always going to be. You're always going to have that. Yeah. Of course you are. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but since then, um, um, the people and I, we never thought it was going to be a huge mass market game or anything like that. So it's always been a small project, you know, indie project. But it um, it was intended for the people who are now playing it. The the people that would the, love you this found game. your people, right? You found you found, we found your, the people. Yeah, We're finding yeah. the people, That's and good. they they love it. Yeah. Well, you know. You dipped your toe back in and you did it in an amazing way with, a, I think it's a really smart, uh, you know, I don't know if it was is something that you were doing as a strategy, but it seems to be a really perfect way to, to come back into this, into this world, whether you want to stay in the world or not and continue to make more games, but what a, what a great way to come back in and, and you, you know, you must know how excited 
you're going to have your haters because you can't get away from them. But how excited yeah. people are to have you and Ken back. Uh, it's just, I mean, the the fans that have I've amassed through this little channel of ours are uh-huh. all, you know, deeply uh, uh, grateful to you for all the, the you well, know, like, like Daniel, who talked to you earlier, just, just you, they grew up with the games that you created. And- I have to say that I am grateful to everybody out there who have played our games and enjoyed them. And that to me, I, 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 in a way I do it. And I started working on them because I love doing it. It's like my mother it was an oil painter and she was very good at it. She loved it. And she never, but she never um, displayed her art. She never had it in any galleries. She just did it and did it and, and just, they all just accumulated over time. And, and I would say, why don't you ever, you know, show and display your work? I don't know. I just do it because I love it. And, and I think that I probably do it because I just love doing it. I love it. I love creating worlds and, and characters and I love having it be interactive. Um, it's for me, so I just love it that people enjoy him. Well, that's a perfect segue to to why we're connecting with you today and, and why we have a, uh, a special guest joining us in just a little bit. But uh, this brings I us... Know, this, so I know. I'm very excited <laughs> to see you two see Sorry. each other. <laughs> but before we bring her out, uh, and that is that Tori will be joining us in a little while. Um, uh, can you... Can you rem- Tell us a little bit about what the birth of Phantasmagoria was, and what was because that was a big shift for you in terms of the games you had been doing. Oh yeah, prior, right? <laughs> big time. Yeah, um, it it started out. I actually worked on fan, the idea of Phantasmagoria for several years before it even actually came into actual existence. So I was trying to think when it came out. I think. It came out. Or what? When did yours come out? Do you remember? Ours, well, we we filmed in we filmed it in. Boy, you know it was. It, it came out in ninety six, and I think 96. that we filmed it in ninety five, ninety six. I think that was, or maybe we even did it. We, you know, but it, it all happened pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think Phantasmagoria. I think you were ninety five. Came out in ninety five. Yeah. yeah. But I remember working on, and that that was uh, uh, that we were still in California when I started working on it, and we moved to, up to Seattle in '93. So I think I started, you know, actually, and w- when I say working on it, it was like thinking about it too, mm-hmm. and ruminating, and you know, and and organizing my thoughts and as to how to do it, probably as early as '92. So. It was prob- it was a good th- you know maybe four year project um, for me from the very I- idea of wanting to do it to doing it. Um, so um, maybe three years, but yeah. anyway, it was it was uh, I, I the first year I spent and the reason why I wanted to do it. That's really what your question was. Why did I want to change? Um, it kind of started out as well. I you know I did King's Quest. That I'm mostly known for King's Quest, and then probably after that, Phantasmagoria. And so um, I was I I was going to be starting to do King's Quest Seven, and it was to and I love King's Quest. I don't want anybody to think you know there's anything against. I I mean, it is absolutely my favorite game and series. Of course, I love it. Um, and it has made so many people happy and, you know, and give, you know, and, and, and I've gotten much fan letters, you know, anything from kids. And I, I saw so many people now that come up and say, you know, I love King's Quest as a kid and it, it's what, you know, got me into the business, but you know, all that. And, but, um, by you, by the time you get to like the seventh one, you start thinking, I, I'm, maybe I'm getting a little typecast and, uh, and also, my games were also sort of known for being, um, you know, sort of, fa- you know, family friendly. Yeah, they were, the, and I'm proud of that. 
You were um, ready for something. You were violence. ready to. You were ready to bust no, out a little bit, weren't you? You can only do. <laughs> you can only do family friendly so much. You need to. You need well, to just, and I and I've always liked. You know, I've always liked. Um, not horror, you know, but like you know, uh, Stephen King and mm-hmm. the suspense stories and ghost stories. Yeah. You know, I've always liked that genre, um, and uh, and scary movies, and yeah. you know, I've always kind of liked that. And and then one day we were at a, a computer fair somewhere, a computer show, and uh, I think it was Electronic Arts was working on something. Uh, or maybe they had a like a an advertisement, you know, can com, can a computer make you cry? Hmm. And I thought it was EA. Uh, I may be wrong on that. And that started me thinking. And well, and then King's Quest. Um, let's see, which one was that? King's Quest Four was. It was around the time of King's Quest Four. Uh, maybe it was right before King's Quest Four. And uh, we, I was working. That was with, the game with Rosella. And King, her father, King Graham, was maybe going to die of a, of a severe illness. And we did our, our opening uh, cartoon, we called it, then um, showing him, you know, clutching his chest and, you know, falling <laughs> down and, in, the, in the royal castle, the throne room, and the daughter and, and the rose, oh, oh, father, you know. And and we showed that at a, at, at might have been... Um, CES or something, I don't know, but um, but we had a big room and a big screen, and we were showing that that opening cartoon of King's Quest IV, and it was a very sad scene, you know. It was very, and we had the appropriate music to sound very big and you know and sad, and oh my god, and and people in the audience watching it, some women actually began to cry oh my they did <laughs> they actually did and um and that was our answer back to ea for can a computer make you cry and and we were so thrilled because it did <laughs> that, that opening scene to king's quest 4 made some people cry and that started me thinking about can a computer m- make you scared mm. can a computer game actually scare you mm. And once that came into my head, I kind of kept musing over it, you know, for a few years and thinking about it. And then a couple of games came out, probably early 90s, and I I knew the names. Of it. One of them had the word dark in it. You may know, Paul. Um, I'm dark. not going to be the D- Daniel, when he comes on, he'll, he'll remember it. Yeah, he probably will. Yeah. Anyway, and, um, anyway, and it was kind of an interactive <laughs> movie. Sorry about that. The housekeepers are here. Um, and uh, and um, I, pl- I played it and I because it w- I was having this interest now of having it see if a computer can scare you. And I, I played it. I wish I could remember the name of it now. It's it's um, it's eluding me. But and, and I thought it was really interesting. You know, it's kind of an interest interesting, but it didn't really scare me. Um but parts of it inspired me and it got me thinking about it more and more. And, and eventually I decided that they, the people that created that were right in using actors. Mm. Oh, was this seventh guest? No. Okay. All right. That's the, that's the no. best I can do. <laughs> no. no, no, it wasn't. I will find um, out. Don't worry. I don't, I don't want you to, but that's, I, 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 I want to say. I remember seventh guest. Did, was the seventh guest an animated? No, that was a early, uh, that was an early uh, FMD exactly. game as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, I played a, like I said, I played a couple of them back then <clears throat> and um, I, I was very interested in them. It it did it did give me the idea that I need to use actors and the reason for that is because there were some other games that were coming around at that time that were using um, typical uh, computer animation to and what they did was tr- they they put in a lot of violence you know and I think you know some fighting and things like that and kind of cr- really creepy looking um, animated characters but again it 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 didn't hit the mark mm-hmm. uh, in my opinion, of actually being able to scare you like a good movie could. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's really what started me down that road, this road. Excellent. Well, um, but, and, and then at what point did, you know, that, that's, there's always that 
point that I love when, as a creative person, and, and when you are working on a, a project or when you have that germ of an idea for a project, and then it starts, it starts to, it starts to germinate and starts to grow and it becomes a, an idea. And then you bring that idea to other people and they get excited about it. And then there's a certain point where you're like, this is actually happening. And there must have been a moment because this was a what I imagine this must have been one of the bigger budgeted shows oh, it was, games you far. ever did. So do you, do you remember that moment of like, we're actually yes. going to do this thing? Yeah. Yeah. It, um, yeah. Cause we actually, Sierra, when, you know, once the decision was made, we were going to do actors. I decided rather than doing it as a, as a full, um, filmed almost like a movie, but with alternate, um, sub, you know, uh, alternate, uh, uh, storylines based upon what the player wants to do, but continuing, you know, uh, filming actors in, in an actual place mm -hmm. or on an actual, um, an actual set, movie sets. <clears throat> I decided, uh, that to, that we would, we would create a, a 3d rendered world and place our actors in, in a 3D rendered world because part, partly because the world I wanted to create, well, we couldn't find, you know, right. it's like, where are you, going, where are you going without, without spending millions and millions and millions of dollars, mm -hmm. you know, where, where, and we, as it was, I think we spent about $4 million on this game, which in early nineties was, was huge. A lot of Huge. money. Yeah. It, it was probably one of the most expensive games at the time to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very expensive, and but to um, but to try to find a place to film it or a movie set, you know, and have all different movie sets for this house, you know, yeah, and everything yeah. would have been. I mean, it would have been way astronomical i mean sierra was a pretty big company and we did we were doing very well but not that well yeah yeah so um and i had just come up me you know i had just come up with this with the script that called for this kind of house and place and we had to figure out how to recreate it mm -hmm. so we decided that we would recreate it with um you know full 3d rendered graphics so the whole thing the whole house the, the 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 little village the island you know the outside it was it was all 3d rendered um, and um, and it would and it was beautifully rendered the problem that we had was because uh, computers couldn't run the beautiful you know like the 3d rent you know 3d worlds we have now mm -hmm. that are so beautifully detailed the the computers back then couldn't run these graphics that we're so used to now couldn't run them. Mm -hmm. So even though our, the, the graphics, the 3d graphic world for uh, Phantasmagoria one was very beautiful and beautifully detailed. It doesn't come out in, in the way that it, it does look yeah. in the game because we had to really lower the resolution yeah, yeah, that makes sense. in order to do it. But that's, how we but but the, put the the actors in this 3D world. Well, speaking of the actors, I don't want to make her wait any longer. I would like to go ahead and bring the actor that we spend the entire time trying to save. And I believe it's not if I'm not mistaken, this will be the first time you two have seen each other since probably the end of that yeah. shoot. All right. Well, let me see if I can get Tori yeah. to come in here. Hold on just a second. So she'll be popping in. There she is. Hi, Hi Tori. Hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, my gosh. It's so good to see you. I know. I know. I almost wanted to wear my hair in the same way that you, 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 you know. The way I used to. <laughs> I remember doing the whole. Yeah, I can't even do that anymore. It just, my hair is like, it's like a witch's broom right now. That was mine. <laughs> No, I remember, you know, we had a makeup, a makeup lady uh, who's so good. Uh, Cindy, I was just talking to Cindy. her. 
Cindy, Cindy. Oh gosh, she was so great. Yeah, she and, was really good. I, I'd come into the studio and, and you know, and Tori would be sitting there, she's getting her makeup on and watching Cindy comb her hair. <laughs> <It's the same. laughs> she would have to look at a photo and then kind of match. They're all exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. Roberta, what do, you, what do you remember <laughs> about, <laughs> I'm curious, Roberta, do you remember the first time you saw, were you in the auditions when, uh, uh, I imagine you were you were there for all the auditions. Do you remember? Uh, no, I was actually not in the auditions. Um, I, I wished I had been, but, um, but I was not. Although I, I was, uh, I did, I was part of the decision in, uh, in Tory and David Holm. Uh, the the two main actors because um, they were so important yeah, <laughs> obviously <laughs> and um, and so but no um, Mark Siebert my the project manager Mark. of the project he did that and and that was because I was um, still involved in King's Quest Seven at the time and I was going back and forth between the two. And I, I just uh, let Mark Siebert handle the auditions, and and while I was still working, gotcha. so I was kind of going back and forth between the two games. Well, what? How do but, you do? You remember the first time meeting each other? When was? Do you have any memory yeah, of? It was what? on the set. I mean, it was in Oakhurst. Yeah, it was in Oakhurst. Yeah. It was on the set, and I, I remember talking about this the script which was so gigantic, 500, <laughs> over 500 pages. And I was, I just couldn't believe that you had written the whole thing. Um, I was so impressed. And then there was some kind of like a, a barbecue or some, there was some kind of a get together at one of the cabins and there was some kind of a lake thing. Oh. I seem to recall, but, um, huh. yeah. But, yeah. but you were you were in and out like you were there, off and on, right at the. Um... Well, um, I was there a lot. Um, the um, I would go away for weekends. Mm. Well, no, every other weekend. That's what we. Yeah, so it was like um, almost four months, and I think I would I would be there, for um, we work six days a week, um, and then took Sundays off. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yes. We worked six days a week. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah. So we worked six okay. days a week and took Sundays off. And so, um, and then every other weekend, I would fly back up to Seattle on Friday and uh, after work and then come back on Monday morning. So I would not be there on uh, part of Friday and then part of Monday and then that Saturday when you guys were still working. Right. Okay. And you had a house there. I remember. I remember. No, I, I was staying in a. No, I was staying in the the, the Pines. Oh, God, what was it? Oh, were you staying? Were you staying at the Pine Lodge when we went to? Oh, it must have been. No, I think I'm thinking of. It was called the the uh, Pines Motel or Hotel. <laughs> I was staying there on the lake. On the, on the lake at yeah, the but... lake, the Bass Lake. So I was staying in the hotel. It. I mean, it was. This it was like a little cabin, though. Yeah, they were all, it, was, it was like little cabins, mm -hmm. and I actually had a little kitchenette in it, so I was staying there. So you probably came over to it, I'm sure. Yeah, I think I must have, but um, yeah, it was such a fun job. It was. It was so much fun, and I remember the first time, like the first time you showed us the what we were looking at on the screen because we had no idea where we were we were just on this blue stage we didn't know where we were and we had to you know the first time we saw like the images on the screen i thought they were so amazing because we yeah. hadn't seen anything like it You're right no i hadn't either actually so yeah it was interesting because uh tori and all the other actors had to stand in front of a big blue background and sometimes they had blue boxes in front of them or you know, uh, all kinds of different size boxes. Yeah. <laughs> all in blue. And, uh, well, where am I supposed to stand? And I'm supposed to say these lines. And then, uh, but it was that we had a uh, next to the blue stage, I guess you'd say, um, or the blue set <clears throat> was a big monitor. And on the monitor was uh, the, the 3D rendered camera angle. 
because even though even though the the, the whole world, the house and and, and everything was a, was in three with three D rendered world, we had the whole thing. But one thing that was nice about making the the game uh, uh, world in three D computer generated graphics is because we could change the camera angles. We could change them, so we didn't. Whereas with Colossal Cave, you see as you run through it, the world is moving past you, and you can look around, you know, around it all you want. You know, you can look down and up and look around. But in this case, because the computers couldn't do that, didn't have the capability of doing that, the way what we did is we decided we were just going to take the 3D rendered world and and just you know make it cinematic by choosing the camera angles we wanted. So every scene, you know, would have one or maybe two different camera angles to it. So we would put up the first camera angle. And um, and so let's say it was the kitchen scene. You know, we're sitting at, it was kind of this round, I think, was it a round table? Um, and with a, a two chairs. And David and Tori had to sit at, you know, they had to come in and sit or maybe you, or maybe he was already there. Or no, maybe I think one of you was already sitting there at the opening, and then one could come in and right. sit I down. Think I, I don't really. Remember. I think it's just. Uh, I, think I think it's just just Adrian that's sitting there at the beginning. Okay. I think. Uh, yeah, and so, and but she's got a cup of coffee, and um, she. But what's interesting is, so she could see herself, um, on the screen. She could see the kitchen table, and she could see the kitchen. And then when she could walk into, and, and that was in essence sort of placed over the blue, but no, actually it's not, I don't know. I, I don't really quite understand actually technology behind it either. But if, if we sat her down, we, we'd have to put the table, the table would have been a blue box with like a blue covered round, I don't know, uh, p- piece of board yeah, covered with blue. And, mm-hmm. and the chair would be like a blue box. And so she she would be sitting on it, and we'd have to place, we'd have to move the camera angle a little bit, and move uh, her a little bit, and the table over a little bit <laughs> to make it match. And so she would be looking at that, and we, you know, and and me and um, our director, we had a movie director, Peter, I can't remember his last name, Maris, Maris, yes, Peter Maris. So, you know, he and I kind of sat together and we would look over there and say, oh, you know, we need to move, the, you know, the blue table over a little bit or move her or, you know, whatever and get it all lined up and then get then get the, the lighting right on them, on her. And then another chair. And if David came walking in, it'd have to be perfect. You know, he have to walk in at exactly the right spot and sit in exactly the right area of that block, his own blue box. And uh, and we had to make sure that when they set the coffee cups down, it was on this blue covered board in front of them. And every single shot had to be done that way. So (laughs) I'm going to share with you. Let me see if I can share uh, a moment here. Can I do the entire screen or a Chrome tab? But uh, I remember that for yeah. acting, it was hard to know how big to go or how small to go because I remember you talking with me about that. Yeah, it was yeah. tricky. What what's happening? What, oh, what I'm going to share with you a photo. I hope I'm going to share with you a photo. Did I get a chance to do it? It doesn't seem like I. Can. I don't see it. Oh, let's see. Does it work? Uh, I'll have Daniel come on and, and do it when he does. I'm oh. not the technical. Well, person I remember right, Tori no would come to me and she'd say because it's an interactive script. Mm-hmm. It it wasn't it it didn't follow a normal script like for a movie, you know, or a TV show. It because it bounced all over the place. Because she would say, "Well, how am I supposed to act on this?" And I said, "Oh, that's on page three hundred and thirty. You know, <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. It says it over here." And she'd say, "But, but yeah, but it says I'm sitting down over here." So, and 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 that's because it was an interactive script because it was a game. <laughs> Right. So sometimes you you shoot things that are on multiple, like pages that are distance apart because you're in the same spot, 
but over, so you have to shoot them all, but you're in different emotional places. Right. One, like, right. So it's tricky. You're yeah. one of the first actors to have to do interactive acting. <laughs> That's <laughs> is, true. That's a really good point. It's, that, it's a feat in, it, in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, you did something, Tori, and everybody well, in that. Well, and it was in interesting for Peter, the director, you know, who had directed actors before, to figure all that out, you know. And then I'm sitting there going and saying to Peter all the time, I'm saying, this is a game, Peter. This is a game. Oh, right. <laughs> you got to remember this. You got to keep it a game. <laughs> okay, so I heard you ask Paul how he felt playing his game. And so I, when I played, so I, I have to say, I had so much fun playing my game. And I, I don't know why it took me so long to play it. I think- I don't know either. I was afraid. I was afraid. Afraid. I was, I was afraid that I would be disappointed in myself. <laughs> I think I've been thinking about it. Okay, why was I so afraid? But I think that's one of the reasons. And, it's hard um, for actors to watch themselves without. It's hard for actors to watch themselves. You can't. It's hard to stay but in the that world that is created. I kind of forgot it was me after a while. Did you feel that way, Paul? I, like, oh. I kind of forgot it was me. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. That's so funny. But I just yeah. enjoyed. I enjoyed exploring the house. I enjoyed how it just took its time. Mm -hmm. And, and then it just kind of, it got more and more exciting and more, more action. And it was, you know, I remember, I don't know if you remember Paul, the, when we did the finale, it was so fun because, ah, oh, the stuff was happening and getting killed. And, oh, and the <laughs> timer, you only had, yeah, you had only so much time to like <laughs> click on the thing to get to the thing. And then sometimes, and I'm sure this was right, a, a problem right. back in the day. Yeah. But um, uh -huh. sometimes your computer, you, you know, we made plenty of mistakes on our own, but there are times that we made the right choice, but uh, the computer did, was laggy or we accidentally, oh. it, we didn't hit the right spot at the right time. And so there's all those uh -huh. moments of getting frustrated because, because, you know, you can yell at the computer for, for not letting you, I died. It wasn't my fault that we died this time, you know, it was someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually got to the end of the game, both of you and both your games. Yeah, we did the whole thing. Right we did it. Uh, wow. Yeah, That's we. Well, we Daniel, Daniel is our <laughs> Daniel's our hint keeper, and uh, he would uh, he he joined us for both games. I mean, so Tori, yeah, we we played both games together. We did like a couple hours a week. So there's probably about ten episodes of us working our way through really? it. Yeah. Yeah. It's on our <laughs> channel. So we have all of us, both of us playing it. And it's, it's a very surreal thing to be this age in a window yeah. watching yourself 30 years ago as an actor in a screen. And so yeah, there, oh, this, God. this whole get, this gets, well, not quite 30, I guess I should, let's call it 26 at this point. Oh. But, <laughs> but yeah. It took us a while to get through the first chapter <laughs> <laughs> like we got episodes. lost a lot. We couldn't figure out how to get. We couldn't figure out some. Like again, part part of the. Um, I'm sure part of those early uh, days, it was difficult, especially with FMV, to create um, a natural sort. Like you know, you, you get a little bit lost in terms of going left to right or right to left, and what the next thing is. It, it lose you lose perspective a little bit, and uh, yeah, yeah. You get used to it. I mean, um, the, um, the, you know, all the, all the, say all the King's Quest are, all, and not just the Sierra Adventure Games, but um, other other companies that had adventure games too, <clears throat> LucasArts and um, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, um, in, uh, I'm I'm losing it. Yeah. Forgive me. Forgive me, people out there. <laughs> um, but that that's just um, that's just the way that adventure games are. And so if you were used to playing them, you you kind of got it, yeah. you know, much quicker. Well, you know, Roberta, uh, Tori and I were not used to playing them. So we spent about an hour trying to find Cyrus. We couldn't, for the life of us, figure out how, where, he, <laughs> where he was. <laughs> but I have to say it was, it, from compared to like um, some of the other games that we just started playing, <coughs> Maneuvering through the house was much easier, don't you think, Paul? Absolutely. It was once we got outside, we got a little bit lost sometimes. Once but, outside. Yeah, outside yeah. is always difficult. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's funny, Roberta. One thing that uh, we also, I, I want to thank you is that, you know, I had never met 
Tori and I had never met each other, you know, and so we both had been you know, the lead actors in these two games and, and not surprisingly, we both had similar, as actors who weren't gamers, we had similar sort of experiences where we just kind of moved on because th we, that mm -hmm. wasn't the world that we lived in. I know that Fantas One had a yeah. much yeah. bigger, uh, was, was a much bigger hit uh, than, than the second one was, but when I decide for me creating this channel was also based on uh covid you know sort of what are you going to do now and it would turned out that what was are you gonna do? yeah so it was the 25th right. it turned out it was the 25th anniversary of the making of our game so yeah. i just started reaching out to all the people who made the game like you know andy hoyos and lorelei and uh, uh -huh. you know and the folks that that uh, you know were a part of that group and then it just made sense once we i sort of finished talking to the folks at Fantas One that I really, I always, always curious about Tori. So I ended up reaching out to her and I don't think you even saw my message on Facebook for like a month or something like that. No, because I just wasn't checking very often. Yeah. And yeah. And then. So uh, much uh, like me, I'm, she had never played her game. So then that's when we decide, well, what if we get together and play this, our games together? You know, it just seems like there's no, there's not a lot of people out there that have starred in FMV games in the nineties. And, uh, no, yeah. no. <laughs> so what's your take on, uh, what, what do you think kept, I mean, I think I know the answer, but what, did, what is it that kept FMV games from continuing? It seemed like it had a short burst and then it, it, it kind of disappeared. Well, that's a good question. I guess I would want to know the answer to that too. I'm like, you know, like I said, I've been out of the industry. I had been out of it since, I mean, once, once King's Quest 8 Mask of Eternity shipped and we sold the company and that was it. So we honestly, Ken and I didn't really think that much about the computer game industry anymore. We were off. You were gallivanting. You know, raging around the world, yeah. you know, on a, on a boat. So, um, and just coming back into it, like I said, kind of like Rip Van Winkle, you know, it was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> what is this? So I honestly don't know um, about the answer to that question myself. I, to I me, it seems like it was, know. to me, it seems like it was a uh, budget, you know, it was difficult to, you know, when you have live actors and at that time, the first person shooter game was really coming into its own. And, and so I think that yep. it was difficult to do these kinds of games and to get the financing for them. Yep. Uh, some of them hit, but some of them didn't. And so, um, but nowadays I there's some too. really interesting, there's some interesting FMV games and not quite to the level of, um, what they were they're a little bit more choose your own adventure you know, and i think that it would be really interesting to go back to a real fmv game now that we have the technology yes. is so much more accessible and i think there's a way to do that and it'd be interesting if somebody I think, that need, I think you need to do that roberta yeah <laughs> and i think it should take place on a boat that's traveling the world <laughs> i don't know does that sound much that sounds like a travel log well, I don't know. I don't know. Is, that, is that very fun? I don't know. Like a pirate, a pirate adventure. That's right. <laughs> a pirate adventure. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I've got ideas, but um, I I don't know yet. We, this uh, With the Colossal Cave, we started a new, I guess, I don't know if it's an entity company. I don't know what it is called Cygnus Entertainment, which is actually our our boat that we have now is called Cygnus. Oh, okay. That's S Y. It's S Y G N U S. Gotcha. And uh, it's and with a swan. That's um, it, that is a um, constellation, Cygnus. Mm. Um, and as um, and it's uh, anyway. And I liked the name, and we used the logo off the back of our boat. <laughs> <laughs> so we sort of threw it together because we said, well, we have to have some, you know, we're going to do this game. Yeah. So now we have Cygnus Entertainment. And, uh, you know, there are some people that are, have sent us their games that they're working on. Um, and we've looked at a couple of them and, uh, we're still, you know, mulling yeah. that and whether I want to do another game or we're, we're, I'm still not done with Colossal Cave yet. Like I said, I'm still working on some upgrades to it. And, uh, I just, I really, uh, I've learned a lot and, uh, some of the things that people have said, I do want to put into it and, you know, and yeah. make it just really pretty. And we were enjoying it quite a bit. It's really, it's really yeah, fun. Do yeah. you know when the, do you know when the upgrades are going to come out? 
Oh, it'd probably be a couple of months anyway. Um, and, and, and like I said, it's for the higher um, PC platforms or, you know, Xbox, the newer Xbox that can run it. So because it's going to take more uh, computer power. And hopefully, yeah. you know, uh, as VR, I mean, one of the things that kind of held us back on graphics was we wanted to, to also put this game on uh, Quest 2 and, and some of the, um, the other VR headsets that mm -hmm. have been out. So we had to kind of limit the, the resolution and how much detail we could put in it because those couldn't handle it too much either. Mm -hmm. A lot of people forget that there's a computer processor behind all this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, whether it's in your laptop or it's in your headset or it's, you know, in, in your um, set-top box or whatever it is that has to run these things and some are more powerful than others. So the upgrade is going to be for the more powerful platforms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but well, then it would be fun to play that on VR because I'm terrified of caves, but if it's, you know, it, <laughs> it would be kind of fun. <laughs> and you're you know, the problem though with VR is, is uh, and which is still everybody who's doing VR games trying to figure this out. It's the sort of nauseating, nauseating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so everybody has been, has tried different, you know, different things. Our, our VR Colossal Cave, you can run through it, you know, and, and have yeah. that, you know, real immersive thing. But um, I was doing QA on it and I could only do it for about an hour and a half to two hours before I said, okay, yeah. it was off my head. And I would go lay down for like an hour just to kind of get over it. And uh, I, I, did, um, I did a segment with, uh, with Game Grumps where we, uh, we, I went through it with, with Dan and Aaron. And we were playing it. And Aaron said to me afterwards, he said, you know, I would play Colossal Cave for VR if, you know, if it, it, it but he says, but I can't because I get too sick. And he said, it's just unfair. I'm in this business and I can't play yeah, so. play it that way. I, it gets too sick. He said, I'm one of those people. Right. And yeah. and he said, you know, a lot of people are experimenting with, um, you, you know, everybody has seen that the Google Earth thing where, you know, you have your little man and you, you know, man on the street or on Google Maps. And mm -hmm. there's like a little bubble or a little arrow and you click on it and it moves you forward or it moves you over here or over here or like that and he says a lot of, you know there's experimentation going on with that and so we're we're also uh putting that that kind of uh movement in our va uh, vr um colossal cave as well um so we are you know like everybody experimenting with how to do this stuff mm -hmm. and using colossal cave as the vehicle to do it. Nice, nice. Hey, uh, sneaking back towards Phantasmagoria. So you you created uh, the, the two games were completely separate from one another. They they didn't have it. The storyline didn't connect, and the the characters right. didn't connect. And I I imagine uh, you must have had. It seemed to me like sort of in the Twilight Zone sort of world where you were going to have numerous uh, one offs that sort of all. That, that horror right. sort of being the theme that, that kept it together, sort of a mature right. horror. Um, right. Was that, was that uh, I mean, obviously that was, that was purposeful, but did you have numerous yeah. other storylines in the, uh, in the mix at, at any good um, point? Well, you know, uh, Fant yeah. I mean, that was the original concept that we were going to do um, that each Phantasmagoria would have its own story separate. You know, it wasn't going to be like King's quest where it was this, a, a story of the same family, you know, the same, sorry, it's the same, um, you know, royal family that's going to be each time you know, going on their, their own little quest yeah, yeah. to save the kingdom, you know, or whatever. It wasn't going to be that um, separate, separate stories. And I really did want to do uh, Fantasy 2, but I was put on King's Quest 8. <laughs> Just like the very beginning of Phantas One, um, I I was kind of back and forth for a while. That that might be one reason you didn't see me a lot at the beginning, <clears throat> because I was going back and forth on on uh, King's Quest Seven and Phantasmagoria, which is one reason why why I wasn't as much involved in King's Quest Seven because I was doing both of them 
Mm-hmm. And they were both, and, and Phantasmagoria was very technical and there was just a lot to do and it was a huge script. So um, that's one reason why I wasn't as involved with it. And, but it's also one reason why you probably didn't see me as much at the beginning. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Going back and forth between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but that was my plan. I And I really did want to do the second, but what happened is, well, we sold the company. <laughs> it was sold the company. And um, and that just threw a clinker in everything. Had you sold the company me, at I that mean, point? We sold the company right after, well, uh, King's Quest, uh, no, Phantasmagoria 1 had shipped and was doing really, really well. I mean, it, it was it was breaking all sales numbers for just about any game and and it was going really strong um and which which then ken said well we gotta you know jump in and so that's where we started on on fantas 2 but normally and but at the same time uh he was in negotiations for selling the company Mm -hmm. and um and which i wasn't at the time a big fan of doing actually um but I was outvoted, but anyway, uh, but because my plan had been to, you know, the well, Fantas was done, and then I knew I had to do King's Quest Eight, and and I wanted to have it be a, a 3D game, and uh, which it, it kind of was. We we did that, but and then go into Fantas Two, and then I would kind of straddle Fan uh, King's Quest Eight and Fantas Two mm-hmm. the same way that I straddled seven and Fantas one and that and that was the plan that's what that that's what i really really wanted to do that and roberta would that have been a completely it, different story that you had would been working on or was it all was it yeah, you know, Fantas two yeah oh yeah it would have been a different story okay it would have been something um, because of course. yeah I, yeah because i i wasn't able to do it yeah because uh, we sold the company and yeah. and i had to, i i had to finish king's quest eight and and if you read ken's book uh, not all fairy tales have happy have have happy endings. There's a whole like the last two chapters explains all of it, um, but it wasn't a happy time. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't a happy time. Yeah, as it turned out. Okay, so we're gonna get into the last portion of our interview, and and I want to introduce you officially to my producing partner, Daniel Aldo. Daniel is a game Hi. developer out of Israel. He is a uh-huh. huge fan and a uh, uh, of of all games from Sierra. Uh, I know that these games had a huge impact on his life, and he is basically what keeps conversations with Curtis alive and running. And so uh, I really wanted to have him come in and get a chance to ask you a few questions. So Daniel, important. Roberta, yeah. Roberta, Daniel. <laughs> Hi, Roberta. Hi. <laughs> so we're going to watch a few uh, photos in a moment from the production of Phantasmagoria. But first, I have a few questions about the production of uh, Phantasmagoria. Okay. So I'll try um, to remember as much as I can. <laughs> So Phantasmagoria came came out in a time in which computer technology was advancing very quickly. And from what I've read, the reason for the multiple delays in the release of the game was the fact that whenever you'd reach a certain finish line, then there would be better technology out there. So then you take the time to implement the newer technology. So my question is, it's understandable that you're trying to make the game as technologically advanced as possible, but... At what point did you feel that the game was ready and finally up to your standards? That was um, that's that's a really um, interesting question. Um, I mean, I'm I am pretty pick, picky, you know, and so I always like, no, it's not ready, you know. I always tend to be a little bit that way. But then the powers that be, uh, Ken Williams, will generally say, no, <laughs> that's it, it's shipping. Uh, <laughs> And that's just, you know, I guess creative people need that. You know, creative people can just keep wanting to go on and on and, you know, no, just, you know, a little more, a little more. It's not quite there. The one I, I'm not, I'm very happy with it though, given, you know, uh, I mean, now when you look at it, it's going to look, you know, pretty dated. And the, the one thing that I, um, that I do though, um, 
the thing that I am sorry about was the sound quality. And, and we really tried very hard to work on that. Um, but but our, our studio where we, where we filmed it was kind of in a big like warehouse kind of room mm -hmm. with a lot of echoing. And, uh, and it's just, cause we were up in this little, little village practically of Oakhurst, California that didn't have anything near <laughs> what you would find, you know, they could be your movie studio. So, uh, the, you know, so they picked out this place and, um, and it was, it was pretty echoey and our tech, our technology team, our camera guy and our, you know, everybody tried to dampen the, the echoey sound as much as they could, but, they just couldn't really do it as much as I would have liked. And so every single time I would play the game, I would go, oh, God, this is so echoey, you know, and just but but it just was what it was. And um, and it was like had to accept it. Well, we can bring Tori to re-record her lines and release <laughs> the game. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that if somebody would do that. Honestly, we don't own own these games anymore when we sold the company, uh, Activision now has these games, you know, Phantasmagoria, King's Quest, and all, all of the old games. And they, but they don't really do anything with them, which is really sad. And um, I, to me, just like with Colossal Cave, you know, you bring it back and, you know, and it's like, well, how do you bring it back? I mean, just imagine if you brought back Phantasmagoria, one or two. And you say, okay, we're going to bring it back and we're going to enhance it. Enhance it. We're going to add to it. We're going to, oh, but now we have to bring it up to modern standards, you know, and we have to do all this and that. And how are we going to do that? And without, you know, changing what it is. And it's, it gets very complicated. And uh, so that's probably maybe one reason why they don't. It's not, e it's not easy. Yeah, I guess the same question that Daniel and I might have is, is there, I know that Activision is supposedly uh, uh, giving over the rights and, and being bought by uh, Microsoft. Do you feel like with the, that too. with the change, do you think that there might be some more openness and would you ever be interested in getting back some of the rights to these games that you created? No, I don't think so at this point. I think um, if we, if we go forward with Cygnus, entertainment it would be with new games um i i think you know we would like to see um newer players you know people um younger people come in and if they've got a new uh, you know a good idea but it would be definitely very indie wouldn't be you know um we we did well but we didn't do well enough to do these big billion dollar multi multi everything you know games uh we you know we don't have the resources for that um so uh so you know we could sort of see ourselves being an, a nice friendly indie you know um company and then you know maybe i i might say well maybe i could do a nice friendly little indie adventure game you know or sure, something sure or or another well, nowadays they can make uh, fmv games with uh 500 uh, not 500 five thousand dollars <laughs> So you can make an FMV game with that budget. It doesn't have to be millions of dollars. Well, so you've got the two lead actors from Phantasmagoria <laughs> series. Well, I, I think you're here. I, I wanna, Let's make a game. I, yeah, yeah, I, I want to. I want to jump on Tori's idea <laughs> and say that yes, I think um, you do have the two. They both Curtis and Adrian survived their games, and if we yeah. put the, if we if we put them on a boat that goes around the world to all the coolest places ever, and we make a game out of that, I think that's what we're saying, right? That it should be a it should be a Mom wants a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> he needs a vacation. Exactly. It would be kind of an interesting idea to come up with like you two, you know, as a you know, you're now an older married couple. How do they find each just, other? Yeah. Yeah, then you just moved out of uh yeah, how do they find each other? <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, and uh, you know, but you uh yeah, and your your kids are now out of the house, you have empty nest, and now what are you gonna do when you go off on some adventure that it turns out really horrible? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and the <laughs> horror itself is uh, married life. Itself. Yeah. <laughs> <Married> life. <laughs> 
All right, Dan, you said you were going to show us some <laughs> photos, but I know you have other questions too. Yeah. This is uh, you directing Tori. Yep. In, in, in what can... seems like the intro. No, it, not the intro yeah, this itself. Is, I think this is the ending scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's sitting in that throne like. She, actually, it's like an electric chair. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, the, I think a guillotine is about ready to maybe fall on her head. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Let's you can see, it as, it. as you said yourself <laughs> earlier, Roberta, you can see that screen or the, the monitor where, where Tori can see what it yeah, looks like. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. If, the res if it was a better resolution, you could see her exactly better, much better. Yeah. But... But Roberta, could I, <clears throat> I can't remember this. I remember seeing the set on the screen, but could I see myself in, in the, in this, in, yeah. the, in the screen too? Or yeah. no, I've seen, remember there are two screens, but maybe I'm mistaken. It was just that one screen. It was the one screen. Okay. Well, there could have been two screens. Maybe you're right. I think maybe one screen showed just the blue. The blue, I thought. The yeah. blue background and then the blue, whatever blue implements or props we put in front of it um and then the other screen um so it could show you either way you know it, yeah. it, depending on the screen we were looking at we could flip to the screen where it just showed you standing at, at the just in front of all the blue stuff mm -hmm. and then flip to another screen that showed that well not maybe it's not even another screen no i don't think it was another screen it was probably I, the same one just flipped back and yeah, forth they would just flip back and forth yeah i remember i think screen, it was and then and then the three the 3d world right and then i could see okay am i sitting in the right spot in the 3d right world? And right I, yeah. and then you would look over and say well i don't think i'm you know or me and you would look and say no she's not quite in the right yeah, spot yeah, yeah. mm-hmm so here we have Tori on a ping pong table. Doesn't look very safe, but um, okay. That's a flattering shot. <laughs> no, that it's, it looks like a, yeah, wait, what is, oh, this is, okay. I was trying to remember how we did some of these shots and I wonder, did we use this platform? Roberta? I for, think what that was for too. Well, there were, there were, the bar, oh, I think. Think. Oh, yeah. no, you know, I think, yeah, there are places where there was like ladder kind of things. Yeah, like it's one, in the barn when, yeah, that must have when been Harriet the barn. is stuck there. Yeah. There yeah. was also me jumping across some kind of a pit and then I almost fall in. And I'm trying to remember how we filmed that where I'm trying to climb out of it. And then there was one, there was a scene where I'm hanging from pipes. And I remember there was water coming from somewhere. I don't know where. Do you remember that? It's lucky you I, survived. Yeah. I I mean, there were so many scenes. You yeah. probably remember it more because, you know, first of all, you were there doing it. Um, I was just basically watching and making sure, you know, that your acting was right or, or whatever. And but, you were doing two games at once, so. <laughs> well, yeah, well, towards the middle, and toward, I was all phantasmagoria. You know, I, I you know, Lorelai, I felt good that she had a good handle on King's Quest Seven and let her go uh, with that. Um, but I was more and more with you towards the end. But um, uh, but also you just recently played the game. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah. You probably remember that. And I haven't yeah. played the game since, well, oh. it shipped. Oh, no, it's Roberta, Roberta. that's great. Roberta, we I, might have to have you yeah. on for a, a little uh, live stream play of uh, Phantasmagoria someday. That might be fun to have you have oh. you play it together. Yeah, actually, that would be fun. That, that would, actually be fun. would be fun. I, I haven't played it in, since then. I mean, literally. Wow. And and I would love to because I loved that game. Oh, it's I have to tell you. This is bringing back a lot of memories, this photo. Yeah. I mean, just it's, it's reminding me how yeah, because of the ping pong table, it was a life in this <laughs> situation. Yeah, I think that that other person um, is, is Harriet. I, yeah, uh, and character Harriet, and was in the barn, who was kind of like yeah. a homeless kind That's of. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the actor's yeah. name is V. Joy Lee, and she is the only mm -hmm. actor that showed up in both games. She played the Rat Girl in Phantasmagoria uh -huh. Two, so the only link oh. between the two games. And she's a Seattle actor that I've. I've known for years, so it was ah. just a local gal. All right, mm -hmm. next, what's the next, Daniel? Oh, look at that. We have. <laughs> oh, that's a funny picture. Don with yep. a pizza face. Yep, yep. 
I think what I don't think that was anything that David actually ever wore, though, in the game. That was that I think that was just a picture being taken. No, he wore it in the game. In oh, the he wore it in the game. Yeah. It's yeah. After that, oh, after okay. that acid, after the Drano was thrown onto mm-hmm. his face. Oh, right? yes. Mm-hmm. The yes, drain yes, cleaner. Yes, yes. Drink the drain cream. cleaner. Uh-huh. The infamous drain cleaner. Oh. And this is uh, Tori oh, you, is that, mourning Spaz the cat. I think that's the, uh, is that a uh, dead cat? <laughs> yep. Dead cat. <laughs> <laughs> now there's Peter in the background. That's Peter. Yep, that's Peter. And here's Tori in another life uh, or death situation. I know. What are you doing there? Okay. I wonder how you survived, Tori. Oh, I don't know how I did it. Okay, that's a that's a forklift. I'm yeah. still, I just realized. I mean, yeah, but why? I am trying to think. Do you remember what that was for? It's I'm the elevator to... in the ending when oh, you rotate the wheel. The hand, the yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. but but that's it's a blue cool. screen. You can just lift her up in the blue screen digitally. Oh. You don't need to lift her up in real life. Not in, Almost not killed in, her. Not in those days. <laughs> Not in those days. Where did you find these photos? I forgot that's how we did that scene. I know. Where did you find the photos? We broke into your house story and we took them. (laughs) I had them all along. (laughs) I haven't. I I, I somehow, when I interviewed you, Tori, the first time, Mm -hmm. I somehow got access to these. I don't remember exactly how I I got them. But yeah, I I, I remember sharing these with you, Tori, when we first interviewed. I don't remember seeing this one though. Yeah, that one's, maybe I didn't share Wait, everything. Did you show me? Did you show me this? I don't remember that. I may have quickly glossed over. Okay, next, next. What else do we got? Next. Okay. That's Peter, the director, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. talking Directing. to her. Yeah, to Tori about what she's supposed to be doing. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Tori looking very uh, not sure if she agrees or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This is story recording voiceover for the game. Oh, Pro- probably well, for um, the scenes in which she's reading things. Maybe I don't know. Um, I know that we would g- go into a special little area and look at the game. Um, you know that the shots we had just done. Yeah, isn't that is that Bill in the background? Yeah, that's Bill. Okay, I re- yeah, I remember doing. He this. was our chief technical guy. He was Roberta, was- here's you cleaning the set. Yeah, uh, there, there I go. You did everything. Well, we had a lot. We had a lot of blood. <laughs> a lot of blood. And Cindy did everything. Yeah. Cindy, our makeup artist, she would. Um, she made the blood. Remember, Tori? Yeah. She would be there, you know, making and stirring up all the blood. Right. Yeah. That's right. We she, almost. Yeah, she made a lot. Of, we almost. We almost got, got Cindy. Cindy to join us today. We, yeah, we uh, we used a lot of blood, and some of it would get spilled, or you know, it get put put down there, you know, on the floor, and yeah, we, we all did everything. Mm-hmm. Well, so please. see, if people don't think that I wasn't there, hands on, I was. No, this is proof. This, this, is, this proof. is the literal definition of hands on. Mm-hmm. This picture, li- literally. <laughs> okay, so now I'd like you to help me solve a twenty-eight-year-old mystery. Oh. In the Phantasmagoria resource files on the CDs that shipped with the game, there are several animations of a mystery woman that no one seems to know who she is. My initial theory is that she was a stand-in for Tori before Tori was hired, but again, it's just a theory. So maybe you know who this uh, no, woman is. No, you have to explain this a little better because I, uh, you mean, oh, you mean uh, that person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you know who she is? No, you know, my guess is she was probably, yeah, no, I think we used at some point, I don't know if it's at the beginning, maybe Tori wasn't there yet, or I don't know, um, somebody, it, it, uh, the guys wanted to get the shots set up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Tori might be in at um, getting her makeup on or hair done <laughs> or her uh, her orange shirt and black pants <laughs> or something. <laughs> and they wanted to just set up the shot so that um, we could get going. So if a morning started um, and we were gonna start shooting that she, Tori would come in, that's being done. In the meantime, the technical guys, the camera guys and could get the shot lined up. Like I was saying that we had to line up where tables were. You could see that the girl is sitting there at a table and mm-hmm. there's something on the table. 
So all the, what she is literally sitting on is a blue box. Mm-hmm. And, and then there is, you know, a, a tabletop, like a board across that also is covered in blue to create the table and, and put the coffee cup there and whatever that is, like a book or whatever it is, mm-hmm. or a magazine, and, um, and make sure that it's in the exact right spot. So when Tori would come out to be shot, you know, to, to do the shoot, it, everything's ready. So all Tori had to do was sit and act. So, so this was the, <laughs> the original outfit? Uh, no, no, that's Because just, I think, I think Tori that, had a different one. Yeah, they probably told the girl to wear some black pants and kind of an orangey kind of top. But I don't think not, she... I mean, not I, the I, trademarked I, or orange uh, sweater. I vaguely yeah. remember like there being somebody, but I don't think it was... I'm sure it wasn't every day. Maybe it was just... No, it wasn't every day. Like the it very wasn't. first day or the very beginning. It might have been at the beginning, more, maybe more at the beginning when uh, everybody... We were all still trying to figure out how to do this exactly. We didn't even really know. We all... I mean, it was a learning experience yeah. for all of us. So that would be my conjecture. Tori has some funny stories about having to wear that same uh, costume for four months straight. Uh, <laughs> well, we had multiple shirts and pants. I just, I do want to say we did that- not. We didn't have multiple pants. Oh, we didn't have multiple pants. <laughs> no, no, because uh, toward the end, they were just disintegrating, and we had to try to find something that would look like them. So I found something and I think we had to do something to them because the back was high on these. They were weird shaped pants. <laughs> so I, I, we only had one pair of pants for some reason. Didn't you say and you yeah, used duct just, tape at some point? I think they were probably your pants. They were my <laughs> pants. They were my pants. So you didn't maybe... have another pair <laughs> that was like them. And I'm so trying I... to remember what happened to this orange shirt after. Well, we had several versions of them. And I know that uh, Mark Mark Siebert bought the shirt. And I don't know how many I, we had. I thought somebody took one. I thought somebody well, took one. We got to track these here. shirts down. But but we had several, we had at least, uh, probably at least three, I would think, of these shirts, but they were white. And Mark bought them and they were white and he actually took them home and he got that dye, you know, how you could put clothes dye in, mm-hmm. I guess, or dye in a washing machine, I guess. Oh, so he, they were dyed. He he dyed them He and he got this pumpkin color. Mm-hmm. Okay. I remember And he dyed them. Wow. And uh, so we had like three of them. Fascinating. Yeah. So I asked you before, when when did you decide to release Phantasmagoria? So the answer is when Tori's pants disintegrated completely and you had to release the game because you couldn't film anything else. <laughs> It's the way it was, yeah. what can I say? <laughs> okay. It Now you talked so about you, you talked about Phantasmagoria 2 being greenlit because Phantasmagoria 1 had great sales but the the teaser trailer for Phantasmagoria 2 came on the CDs of Phantasmagoria 1 so it seems that you greenlit the game even before you saw the sales numbers how did you know in advance that it's well, going to be I don't a huge know. hit I, Well that that I think was my husband's um enthusiasm <laughs> you know he wanted You know, I, and, and partly just to start advertising ahead of time, you know, for Fantas 2. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, Fantasmagoria 2, um, the left cover is the one in the US and the right cover is the one, the European release. And as you can see, in the US, they didn't emphasize the fact that it, it's, it was a Fantasmagoria game. Well, in Isn't Europe, that interesting? That's interesting. it's written in bold letters. Yeah, I wonder why they didn't. That's, I would, like I said, by the time Phantasmagoria 2 was being done, I was, you know, almost out of there, you know, just finishing up King's Quest 8. It was, like I told you, it was sad. It was a sad time for me. Mm. And I, I was so out of the loop by this time mm. that, you know. Mm. Now, you may know. not know, mm-hmm. but Adrian's story Adrian's story has continued without you in Phantasmagoria oh. 2. It has? You want to see? It sure. Has. Sure. 
So in Phantasmagoria 2, there's an Easter egg in which uh -huh. in the third chapter, Curtis, uh -huh. the main character, played by our very own Paul Morgan Stetler, uh -huh. gets a postcard. And this is the postcard he gets. Can you hear the sound? Yeah. Bridget's Books is proud to welcome best-selling author Adrian Delaney. Ms. Delaney will be signing copies of her latest book, Coping with Loss. Hmm. <laughs> She's pretty. See, he already opened the door for a sequel. He's, yeah. yeah. If they only had met in that bookstore, maybe he went and saw the, maybe he went to the signing. <laughs> that is, maybe in your good. Fantasmagoria too, the actual, um, the actual tasks in the game would be to write that book, Coping with Loss. <laughs> Coping play Adrian, with and we get her to write the what, book. What did you lose, Adrian? <laughs> uh, she lost Dawn. <laughs> she, she lost, lost Dawn. <laughs> she lost Dawn. She lost my cat. The house. Cat. <laughs> your house? Yeah. My house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, before one final thing, I wanted to ask... Uh, Roberta, is mm -hmm. we um, we did a small crowd a crowdfund to uh, purchase a sealed copy of Phantasmagoria 1, and I have it right here. This hasn't been opened in 28 years. You're going to open it? Oh, gosh. It's a sealed copy. Yeah, it's sealed. I, 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 need, I need your blessing to open it. Oh, don't ask me that. <laughs> I, uh, don't ask me that. That's... I've got two copies of unsealed uh, or sealed, sealed uh, Phantasmagoria. Sealed. Oh, wow. Really? Wow. I know. I know. I, I guard them with my life. Nice. Nice. <laughs> well, Roberta, I just can't thank you enough for spending time with us. I, I, we have a couple of questions that have been submitted sure. from some fans, and then I think we can let you go. But before that, let me see if I can find these here. Um, and then you shared something with us as we were just sort of setting up. And I think that maybe the question that I ask you can lead into that. But um, yeah. uh, so I'm, maybe some of these can just be real quick. You can just dive right in. So <clears throat> Sasha K wants to know, what's your favorite book? Well, yeah, um, I, I, I'm i going to admit that I did get a sort of advance notice of the questions. But I'm glad I did because I wanted to think about <laughs> think about this, um, and I I you know I wrote it down, and it and you know and it depends yeah. on what time of your life you're talking about. Absolutely. Um, and, and the one thing that I have noticed is that I don't read books now like I used to. When I was a child, I was a bookworm, and I at, at I would say basically, uh, fairy tales, myths, and legends. Wizard of Oz series, uh, Alice in Wonderland, and um, Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> as a girl, nice. as a as a as a child, nice. um, as an adolescent, uh, adventure tales of any sort, um, from uh, pioneer stories to Robinson Crusoe, and then and but I also anything that's just adventure, people out, you know, doing really challenging things out there and having an adventure while doing it. And, uh, but I also like Nancy Drew books. So, uh, that, uh, did I say movies? No, I didn't know. If I did, I'm, I didn't mean to. And, and Nancy Drew book. I really love Nancy Drew, which is probably one reason that sort of, um, I was drawn also to, um, to do Laura Bow um, mystery series, which I unfortunately was only able to do the first one kind of like with Phantasmagoria. I wanted to continue them, but then, well, gosh darn it, and another King's Quest would come my way. Well, you got to do the next one, you know. Oh, but I want to do the next Laura Bow. No, no, you have to do King's Quest 3 or whatever. And and I love doing them, though. I did. I did. So I don't want to disappoint anybody out mm -hmm. there. As a young women, woman, um, I liked historical novels, uh, uh, starting with, uh, well, James James Mitchum. Uh, books. I was really into origins of things, uh, how things came to be geologically and in history and all that. I've always been a big person uh, for that interest. 
Um, but but actually, probably my favorite author, which uh, which is a is a guy by the name of Gary Jennings. You know, he no longer is a has is alive. Um, he's not around anymore. But he wrote a book called Aztec, and also uh, the Journeyers. And Aztec was about, um, and it was like a seven hundred page treaties on the Aztecs, you know, in Mexico, but done in a, you know, but done in a story, story way it was an excellent book. And the journey is about Marco Polo. Fantastic book. Um, and I also read Spangles by him and, and also, um, you know, any other, and I think he was my, my, probably if I were to think of all the authors ever, that would, he would have been my favorite author. Um, and, and nowadays, Basically, anything that's historical, especially if it's just historical novels, but especially if it's um, of ancient history, ancient, you know, like really ancient. Um, I'm kind of into that. So Great. That's awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and then uh, MDQP wants to know, what's the game or a game idea, if, it, if the game never got made, that you are the most proud of? Oh, was that a was that a question? Ooh, yeah. I wonder if I a game idea that I'm most or or, or the, what what um, game itself or, that you did or game idea it could be either or or we could oh okay I think that's what we're, well obviously King's Quest I mean that that's numero uno I mean it will always be numero uno uh, so that that would be the short answer to yeah, that okay good and I'm gonna skip ahead through some of these here mm -hmm. just to uh, let's see. This, let's see. I'm going to read this moment. This might be too. You and Ken both. This is from CT by CB. You and Ken both had projects at Sierra that were close to your hearts. For Ken, it was clearly the foundation of what would later be the Imagination Network. For you, it always seemed like Phantasmagoria. Uh, in this case, and retrospectively, how would you have imagined Sierra's future going if the CUC Sendent purchase hadn't gone ahead? Yeah, I guess he's just um, saying how what would what would have been in store. Where would it have gone? Yeah. Well, I think we would have continued on, and um, we we were already starting to head into certain directions like the internet, and starting to think about three D um, and uh, not VR yet, um, multiplayer. Um, I mean, we were all, already were looking at those things. Um, and and really starting to look deep into the internet and how we could start uh, putting moving Sierra more over into an internet world. Yeah. Um, you know, when we sold Sierra, it was just at the we literally sold Sierra just as the internet was starting to come into. Yeah. You know, and so it was right at that right. that time period. Right. So we would have advanced into it, and who knows if we hadn't sold? I mean. You know, Sierra could be one of the biggies now out there. Oh, <laughs> you know, with billion yeah. dollars. It could have been Amazon. Yeah. You know, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But we did. So you know, we sold. So that's that's okay. that. But that's more likely what we would have done. All right. And then you know, there's a few. There's a number of questions, of course, about King's Quest. But the one that uh, I, I want to sort of lean into to get to what you shared with us earlier is. Um, a lot of people asked, like, what would have been next? What would have been it had you moved on to a different King's Quest game? What were the King's yeah. Quest Nine? Yes. So <laughs> can you yeah. share with us? What uh, you well, yeah. Well, when I saw that question, I it, I was reminded that, um, and I'm trying to read this. It's kind of dark in here. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, this, uh, what I'm going to hear, what I'm going to read here, it was a King's Quest nine, uh, overall story. And when did, the, and when did you write by, this? Yeah. It was written by me, um, October 7th in 2020. Wow. Okay. Uh, and in about 10 or 15 minutes, it was just a stream of consciousness thing. Um, and the reason why I did that is um, it was in response to um, a, there's something called a King's Quest on, Omnipedia. Anyway, it, yeah, it's a King's Quest Omnipedia article about um, potential King's Quest Nine. It was it was in the Omnipedia uh, King's Quest Omnipedia, and and it was a whole thing written about uh, 
the potential King's Quest Nine. Okay. And um, and uh, and had some early ideas put in it and, and all that kind of stuff, which um, it just for some reason I I just felt that I wonder what it would be. <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, what would it be? You know, um, if I had gone ahead. And uh, and so this I just wrote this. If I mean, it's like it's a nice paragraph. So. I don't know if you want yeah, to read just, it yeah. or or you, you can read it. And then if you can, maybe if we, if possible, yeah, just read okay. it to us now. If you get bored, let me know, no, it's but not, it's, it's not that long, but I won't. Um, okay, <clears throat> here we go. If, um, and this is like I did, like I said, I wrote this just about three years ago. So um, not even three years ago, about two and a half years ago, King Graham now elder, now elderly was very grateful to the local knight, Connor. That's the guy from, from King's Quest VIII. Because everybody always said, who is he? <laughs> you know, how did this guy get in, you know, into the King's Quest world? So I was trying to put, you know, now put together, you know, how King's Quest VIII now makes some sense and back in the royal family and all that. King Graham, now elderly, was very grateful to the local knight, Connor, for saving the kingdom of Daventry from the evil arch, arch archon, Lucreto, and restoring the mask of eternity to its salubrious protective powers. So grateful, in fact, that he had given Connor the title of Marquis of Daventry, with the responsibility of securing the kingdom's borders from any outside attacks or evil intentions. In the interim, a charismatic healer, Rasputris, <laughs> not Rasputin, <laughs> Ras, uh, uh, an, in the interim, a charismatic healer, Rasputris, had wandered into Daventry and had embedded himself into the household of the elderly king and queen by curing them of their stiff aches and pains most related to the after effects of having been turned to stone in King's Quest VIII. <laughs> <laughs> Rasputris has made himself so important in the Daventry court that his powerful influence is now corrupting Daventry, the Daventry from the inside, from the inside. <clears throat> Rosella has become, Rosella, the, the, the princess Rosella, has become very concerned about her parents and their sudden dependence on this itinerant drifter. And she tries to evict him from the kingdom, but to no avail. It's obvious that they are both heavily influenced by the elderly parents, by Rasputris, and indeed are overwhelmed by him. What has he done to them? <laughs> Rosella then enlists the aid of her brother Alexander, now the king of the land of the Green Isles, and Connor, the new Marquis of Daventry, to help rescue King Graham and Queen Valenice from Rasputris's evil clutches. But during their endeavors, they find that Rasputris is more than he seems, a dirty, unkempt wanderer with bright hypnotic eyes. In reality, he was an accomplice of Lucreto, who was in um, King's Quest VIII, I think, right? Where did I get that? Yes. Um, in reality, he was an accomplice of Lucreto from King's Quest VIII. Unfortunately, he had been accidentally blasted out of the realm of the sun when the Mask of Eternity was restored. And it is now in the process, oh, and is now in the process of taking over Daventry from the inside in retaliation for Connor having defeated Lucreto and his evil plans. It will not be an easy task to root this powerful character out from Daventry. And then I went on <laughs> and said, as a separate thing, and you never know, maybe an affection will develop between Rosella and Connor, question mark. And poor Edgar, question mark. Hmm. A struggle could commence between Edgar and Connor. But not in this game. 
in King's Quest X. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Got, already you have a little carrot dangling after the carrot you're dangling. Well done, Roberta. No, I mean, I'm not going to do that. Oh, okay. So I only read it to put it out yeah, there. That's great. Well, that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> Who knows who may take that? That sounds fun. If anything, probably nobody, but it's yeah. it was just a fun thing I did. Roberta Williams, thank so. you so much for taking some time to chat with us. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. It's a pleasure to connect you and Tori together for the first time. And it was, oh, thank you. And it was really nice to see you again, Tori. It was so great to see you. It was I really know. Fun. I know. We'd have to do it again, maybe. So, yeah. Uh, well, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, and uh, very much. And Daniel so. and I can't thank you enough. So yes, uh, enjoy the uh, continued work on on Colossal Cave. It's it's, it's wonderful. We, we're looking forward to playing more. And still and, in project. Yeah. Still in project. And we look forward to seeing what you and Ken come up with next. And uh, well, me too. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully we'll we'll stay in touch and and uh, all the best to you until then. All right. Thank you. You're thank welcome. you. All the best to you guys too. Bye bye. Bye. Well, that was something, wasn't it? <laughs> really fun chatting with her. She was great. Really appreciate the time she gave. We had a great time. I hope you did too. And uh, if you did enjoy this conversation and all the ones that we've done before and the ones that are coming up, just want to say, please support us. We, we could use your support on Patreon or Coffee, uh, so that we can continue to bring the content that we do. Uh, conversation with Curtis is growing. Daniel and I are putting tons and tons of hours into this channel in hopes that you have some entertainment that you can enjoy on a weekly basis. And uh, to keep that going, we need your support. So please consider doing that. Meanwhile, thanks for everything. And we'll see you on the very next Conversations with Curtis. Take care, all. Bye-bye.